I'm Suzanne James from Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Today, we will be talking to New South Wales Senate candidate for Socialist Alliance, Dr. Nico Lecker. Nico is a nurse specialist with mental health experience and has a doctorate in health social science. He's a longtime asylum seeker and refugee advocate and climate change and anti-war activist. Nico joins us now from The Hunter to talk to us about his campaign. Nico, thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning, Suzanne, and um, good to see you and to join you. After years of frontline advocacy work and on the picket lines as an enrolled nurse and fighting for various pain conditions improvement, tell us about uh, a little bit about how you got to be running for the Senate. How did you get to here? How did you get involved with Socialist Alliance? Okay, it's a very quick story. I was strolling down the Hunter Street Mall one day thinking all was not well with the well, all not all was not well with the world. Sorry. And um, there was a chap there who sold me a Green Left Weekly. His name's Stephen O'Brien. He's still a comrade up here. And from that, um, a few months later, 9-11 happened, and the um, those guys painted no on the opera house. And um, someone said, um, because I was saying, what a terrible thing, they'll find $50,000. And someone said, well, do something about it, hold a fundraiser. And I thought, yeah, I can do that. And so basically that was my introduction to activism and also to writing occasional articles for Green Left. But that was 20 years ago, 21 years ago, and um, things have just gotten catastrophically worse. And so... Um, it is necessary. We need to face up to the fact that the age of business as usual is well and truly over. And so I think by going into the Senate or trying to join the Senate, um, it's an opportunity to look at the big picture. Now, a big ticket item in every Australian election, especially since September 11, is the issue of refugees and asylum seekers. Obviously, it's been thoroughly weaponised as an issue by the major party. And we've recently seen the release to the Park Hotel refugees, some of them banged up in there for nine years, even after no adverse security clearance finding. Um, some commentators are saying that their release now is an election ploy and has no policy value going forward. What's your comment on that? What, what happens next with the Park refugees and what's the Socialist Alliance line on refugees and asylum seekers? Um, it certainly is an electoral ploy. Um, and in fact, it's a way of increasing the cruelty of um, the Australian government towards the refugees. Because on the one hand, it's an admission that that whole policy, stop the boats, locking them up, um, and so on, was just bullshit, was just racism. There was no reason. As you said, there were no adverse security findings. Um, and they never got told as to why they were released. Nothing. It was all rubbish. Um, and most of the refugees themselves who were released, as well as the majority of advocates, recognise it's a cynical political manoeuvre. Um, but what's happening now is that they're actually in, in an even more parlous situation than they were, because while they were in detention, at least we knew where they were and they had each other. Now that they've been released into the community, it's another form of detention, because what they've been released into is a form of planned destitution. So it's every bit as racist. And in fact, they can now be picked off one by one by the department. They'll never know when they're going to be picked up off the street, taken back in and then deported. It can all happen so swiftly without anyone being aware. Um, and as far as the Socialist Alliance policy is concerned, it's a good one. But before I go into it, let me just say that Australia, and this is something that the refugee sector has to tackle, Australia was explicitly founded as a racist nation. When the Federation was, was first happening, the first two pieces of legislation that were passed were both racist. There was the Pacific Islanders Act and there was also the Immigration Restricted Restriction Act. The first was designed to sort of kick Pacific Islanders out of Australia and the second was designed to keep Asians out of Australia. Um, they also were giving them, gave, gave themselves the, the right to sort of basically exclude, throw out anyone that they didn't want from this country. Someone objected that that is a despotic provision. And um, 
Isaac Isaacs, who later became the Chief Justice, said, well, if we cannot have a, a um, despotic um, uh, position in this legislation, then we can't do what we want at all. And so it goes right back to 1901. What, what Howard said that we decide who comes to this country has been said many times before. Um, so the Socialist Alliance stands for ending mandatory detention, stands for ending offshore detention and so-called processing, um, giving people um, the opportunity to have their claims for asylum heard in the community, giving them full work rights, full um, Medicare and education rights while their claims are being heard, um, giving all refugees um, full citizenships, moving away to um, them becoming Australian citizens, um, ensuring that they have access to family re reunification. Um, let me see, what else is it? Getting rid of the Australian Border Force, which is a disgrace, absolute disgrace. I won't swear on television in case there's little children listening. But um, we need to get rid of that whole department and that whole structure and return to the idea of an immigration department and a customs department. God knows how much money has been spent with this whole thing, billions and billions, which has just gone into the pockets of, you know, corporations uh, without hardly any oversight and of no benefit to Australia. Um, it will cost a fraction, like I think less than a tenth um, of what it's cost us to keep these people in, in cruel and inhumane conditions. Yes, As Amy Ramekis famously said on Insiders one morning recently, the cruelty is the point, yeah? Yeah, the cruelty is the point. And it's very much so when it comes to when um, Scott Morrison made a comment in 2014 of taking the sugar off the table, uh, he was talking about asylum seekers who had made their way to Indonesia and they were planning to come to Australia because Australia is the only country in the region that's actually signed the UNHCR. And these people thought that that signature meant something. They were coming here uh, in order to find safety. What Morrison did in 2014 was he said, we are not taking any refugees from Indonesia. And so there's 14,000 people now who have been stuck there since 2014. They have no rights in Indonesia. And just recently, Australia has even cut back further the amount of funding that it had been providing to the International Organization for Migration and the UNHCR. That is one of the, the most disgraceful crimes. Um, it's like a massive black hole. And that's something that we have to address as well. Another area in which Australia has lagged behind the rest of the world, of course, is dealing with climate change. I'd like to talk about that next, if I may. We've had yeah. yet another damning IPCC report released internationally. Uh, locally, we've had floods, fires, bushfires, drought, you name it, in the last 10 years. Most recently, the floods up north in Lismore on the east coast. Um, can you... Give us an idea of what your Socialist Alliance priorities are in addressing climate change and what is your policy on the transition to renewables, which obviously is something that is going to have to happen, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Australia and climate, um, not that different to refugees. Um, you can substitute one for the other because um, the way the Australian government has been behaving is equally as despotic as far as the climate is concerned. And it just, it just beggars belief to think that even now, both major parties are still keen on approving more fossil fuel projects across the board. That has to stop. That's got to stop immediately. No new coal. The other thing is we need, before we were talking about a planned transition, hopefully we'll still have time for a rapid planned transition away from fossil fuels. We know that you know, the, the technology is already here for renewables to basically to take over. There is no further need for fossil fuels. How you say transition for workers in those areas without any loss of work rights. Um, let me see. The other thing yeah. is that the power industries, Suzanne, um, have to be brought back. The whole power grid has got to be brought back under national control. That's ridiculous having that. You know, it's a public utility. People have forgotten what the word public utility means. It's nationalised. It's not a, um, a, a way of making profit. Um, and also with the introduction of um, 
green energy, renewables, it's going to be a lot more distributed, you know, um, and so therefore um, we need like a different model completely, like a more socialist model, which is a lot more equitable as far as um, distributing power and so forth. We have to end immediately logging of old growth forests and um, we have to get started on reforestation. And one of the major things is that we need to return to the indigenous people, to the indigenous rangers, to their knowledge and get them to lead us the way out of this mess to, so that this country can actually be cared for and so that our children um, can live in a country that um, has a livable climate. Another major area of inequity growing in Australia by the day is lack of access to affordable health care. A large, a uh, big ticket item for discussion this election also has been the inclusion of dental and mental health in Medicare. Now, nobody doubts there's a glaring need for that. Uh, the only question is how we intend to pay for it because it will make no mistake cost billions and billions of dollars once all of that is addressed. So what's the Socialist Alliance view on including dental and mental health in Medicare, in fact, on Medicare in general and how that's paid for going forward? Yeah, that, that is a vital question. Um, first of all, it's assumed that it's a big ticket item, that we're going to spend this many millions on health and so forth. In actual fact, um, it's not a matter of expenditure, it's a matter of investment. Um, there was a visiting professor of economics, Professor Len Gray, and I asked him many years ago, I said, how come, Len, when it comes to spending money on health, that's regarded as an expense. But at the same time, they're talking about spending more money on the Williamtown Defence Facility, and they call that an investment. How can that possibly be? You know, the defence facility kills people. That's its whole purpose. It's not really an investment, whereas health um, is, is really, it's productive. Um, and so if we take that perspective, that investing in healthcare actually pays off mega dividends. Take dental care, free dental care. You know, dental care in Australia is a major, major issue because um, without good dentition, your body is stuffed. You're not going to be able to eat properly, and therefore you're not going to. You know, everything is not going to function as a result of that. Um, you've got to have free dental care. It's absolutely insane the amount of money that's just being thrown away. Um, you know, by uh, people getting in there and making profit out of dental care when in fact it should be under Medicare. Um, and the same with mental health. Um, I think mental health issues are now like probably the second most prevalent chronic condition um, in Australia and throughout the so-called developed world. Uh, it's absolutely vital that that comes under Medicare. But again, there, um, and, and the same with um, the NDIS uh, and disability services, there's this increasing focus on medicalizing everything, which then leads us straight to big pharma. Um, and in fact, we now know that um, you know, the, the magic pill is no magic at all. It's just a way of making more profit. Um, and so therefore we need to invest far more wisely with um, what services we're, we're supporting and what we fund and what we pay for. Um, we we have to um, have like a, a greater focus on prevention with more community care networks. We also got to do a lot more as far as um, nursing care um, in, in aged care, which is a federal responsibility. There should be mandated nursing ratios for that. Um, drug drug use that has to be decriminalised. It's silly to keep regarding something which is clearly a health problem, health issue, as if it's something criminal. It's totally counterproductive. And the same goes for um, uh, these uh, drugs. What do you call these drugs? Like marijuana and so on. Um, uh, You'd be referring to medical cannabis. Yeah, well, yeah. medical cannabis, but also recreational drugs. And that there's no point in having that as criminalised. There's other countries in which they regard that as a health issue or community issue, and they deal a lot better. A way of paying for this is um, by getting rid of health insurance because that should not be necessary with Medicare or if you do need health insurance for some particular things, and that's fine. But the, 
amount of money that is paid out in the health um, insurance rebate is criminal. And in fact, um, they recently, the health insurance people got together and made some submission to the government saying, oh, look, we now have to charge more and offer less because of declining participation in health insurance. It's down to 30 percent. Um, and this is supposed to be mandatory. That's ridiculous. It clearly shows that the market is failing in healthcare. But you try and Google, you know, like you can Google anything and find the answer to just about anything, can't you? Yes. As I pointed out at the press club. Indeed so. But you try and Google how much money we are actually paying for this um, health insurance rebate. I can't find it. And I'm good at Google. I can't find out how much is being spent. Susanna, just let me rhapsodise a little bit. Asylum seekers, climate, healthcare, each one of those billions going in front of our eyes to entities that we can hardly see and that we hardly know about. We are living in a time in which rotting is king. Sorry to get so passionate about it, but... No, no, it's good to see passionate candidates and we really appreciate you sharing your policy platform and um, campaign with us this morning. How's your campaign going, by the way? Um, oh, we've, we've just started, and, and in fact, the first day was, was superb. Um, I think um, we held a Green Left Weekly stall in Hamilton outside the post office, which is closed, of course. Um, but anyway, um, and heaps of people just kept stopping and um, venting. There was nobody that I saw that said vote for Morrison, not a single soul. And a lot of people had um, serious doubts about the ALP's position on many issues. You know, there's some things, yes, you know, getting rid of TPVs, sure, but other stuff um, they were seriously concerned about, in particular on climate. Um, but well, you're one of many candidates in an increasingly crowded field. I think that's a reflection of how disgruntled voters are with the major party. So we wish you the best of luck with your campaign, Nico. Thanks very much for speaking to us this morning. All right, it's been a pleasure, Suzanne. Thanks very much for the opportunity. You're welcome. Okay. Bye that now. was Nico Leaker, Socialist Alliance candidate for the Senate in New South Wales, who joined us from the Hunter this morning to share with us his Socialist Alliance platform and his view, vision for the future of Australia. He's hoping we can talk to Nico again after we've had a change of government. Right. I'm Suzanne Jones for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.